G'day everybody, this is John Paul Wallace for ChessLecture.com. We're starting a new and exciting series this week, looking at Judith Polgar's games. She's uh, the world's strongest female player. She's currently ranked 14th in the world with an amazing FIDE rating of 2,711. Uh, she was born in 1976, so she, she's the same age as me, in Hungary, in Budapest, I believe. And um, I know Judith Polgar. We've um, being the similar ages. We've played several tournaments together over the years, and and actually she's played some tournaments in Australia together with her sisters. But funnily enough, I first met her in Romania, in the World Under 12s. And she went on to win that when we were both 11-year-olds. <clears throat> she's um, she, together with her sisters. They're quite they're, they're quite a famous trio. Uh, there's um, her older sister Susa is a grandmaster, and her sister Sophia is an international master. So they're all unbelievable players, and they're coached by a very famous coach himself called Laszlo Hazai. He's an international master and has also coached myself and Grandmaster Ian Rogers, Australia's best player. It's also interesting to mention how this came about to have such a powerful fa uh, family, three, three title players and also unusually all girls. Uh, their father's a psychologist and apparently, I'm not too sure about where the rumours and the facts sort of converge, but it was was sort of an experiment to see if it was possible to train people to become strong players rather than it only being natural talent. And uh, certainly, they're all talented, so um, it seems that maybe it was a coincidence they just happened to be talented as well. But uh, from my experience, it takes a combination of both. You have to have both if you're going to make the world elite. Uh, but I also know for a fact that their training program was pretty, pretty, very rigorous, actually, pretty amazing. And it wasn't just chess, but also physical tra training. Judith's style is um, very attractive and makes it fun, very fun to watch. She's always a... Uh, audience favourite because not only is she female, which is we don't have much of in chess, unfortunately, but she's very aggressive, direct, and always gunning for the king. And she's also what I would call theoretical, which means that she plays the main lines in the openings and knows them very well and isn't scared of playing book variations. Now, just to illustrate how aggressive she is and how she can quickly wipe out strong players. The first <clears throat> the first game of this series and the second one for next week, she wipes out her opponents in under 30 moves. And her opponents are very strong grandmasters. Today's game, she's playing against another Hungarian called Berkes, or Berkesh, probably is more correct in the Hungarian pronunciation and she's white. This game was played in 2003 in Budapest. Judith starts out with pawn to e4, which is far and away her most popular move. In fact, I've never seen her play anything else. It suits her aggressive style. And Burkes responds with the French defence. Now, Judith is actually an expert in the French defence. Together with Laszlo Hazai, they've analysed this opening very deeply. So naturally, she goes to the main, the main lines. <coughs> Knight c3 being the most aggressive line against the French. Light responds, Knight f6. And now move four, Bishop g5. This is the sharpest variation, although... Playing for e5 is also very good. But if 
if you want the most complications, then bishop g5 is probably the best choice. For example, if bishop e7 now, white has a very promising pawn sacrifice, e5, knight fd7 and h4. This is exciting stuff. Black can win a pawn here. But white gains pressure on the king's side and an open h-line for the rook. And you can start harassing the queen. Perhaps the best way would be with knight h3. So this gives white a promising attack. It's going back to the game after bishop g5. Burkez took on e4, which is the most popular line these days. Very solid. Bishop e7. Breaking the pin. Now what has to do something, swap off something on f6. And Judah takes with the bishop. Knight takes is also possible, but bishop takes f6 is logical, keeping this knight on e4, which is a nice and centralised piece. Simple development now for both sides, knight f3, black castles. Now queen d2. And this is the move that signals Judith's aggressive intentions. She's going to castle queen side. The opposite, obviously, is uh, what Burkess has done. And if you want to launch a direct attack on your opponent and play very aggressively, it's normally a good idea to castle in the opposite direction. It gives you more scope to throw up your pieces and pawns in the direction of your opponent's king. Black plays bishop e7 here, which is preparing a c5 break, but to me that looks a little slow. It's been played before. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. Knight d7 was played first. White castled queen side. And now bishop e7. But it's the same comment that applies. It looks like a slightly slow move. Together with black's next move, white. White's playing very accurately now. Bishop d3. Accurately and aggressively. Whereas Black's play seems a little bit odd to me. Now B6 again. It's, it's, it has all been played before, but it's a little bit of a slow system. Instead of B6, it looks more interesting to go either for something directly with C5 or aiming for a B5 break. Something more aggressive, you could go A6 and B5 or even Rook B8 playing B5, something a bit more active. But anyhow, b6. Burkez is following theory and has been played before, so he probably wasn't expecting to get done in 24 moves. And now Judas starts a powerful attack. Knight on e to g5. Now Judas' play <coughs> is um, very direct and aggressive, perhaps even more so than Gary Kasparov's. And I may have mentioned before that it's quite interesting that you can play directly in chess and be very successful. So even though sometimes the right way to play or or, or somebody's preferred style might be to more, be more deceptive, uh, being direct in chess can actually be just as powerful, sometimes more powerful, because you get a situation where, sure, your opponent sees what you're going to do, knows what you're going to do, but they just can't do anything about it. They're just overwhelmed by the force of your attack, and it, you don't need to be deceptive. You just go straight for them, and they collapse. And um, a lot of people have said that. That's what happened when they played Gary Kasparov. They, they saw all these moves coming, and there was nothing they could do about it. And um, I have a similar vibe from a lot of Judas games. She just goes straight for you, and... Um, here it's very clear she's just launching a direct attack on the Black King, but Burke has still failed failed to sort of find the right way. Now, if G6, 
why I could start attacking with H pawn, H4, H5. So he played H6, hitting the knight. She just gave a check on H8. That was a new move at the time. King in the corner, and now the point of this check, not to retreat the knight on G5, but bishop E4. Hitting that rook on A8. Now if rook B8, this wasn't played, then white could simply continue with H4 with a very dangerous attack. Black can't take that knight on G5, because white would capture back the deadly H line against the black king. So after bishop e4, Burkes took that knight on g5. Now sacrificing the rook on e. Now Judith actually didn't go and take that rook. First of all, let's see what would have happened if she did. Bishop takes rook on a8. Burkes would play g4, hitting the knight. Should that knight move, for example, knight e5. And bishop g5 with a pin against the queen and king. f4, blocking the king. Blocking the pin, sorry. Now g takes f3. Burkes would have won the Judah's queen here. So needless to say, this is not what Judith wanted. And besides, she had an unbelievable move planned in this position, which Burke has either not seen, even though he's a stronger air master, ranked 2,578, so just under 2,600, or maybe he'd seen it and, um, and thought he'd be able to survive. But anyhow, G4. It's a fantastic move simply blocks the g-pawn, which is important, not because Jude is particularly interested in that rook on a8, but because after rook b8, h4 is played. And now the opening of the h-file against the black king is forced, no matter what black does. Had Judas g-pawn been back on g2, Burkes could have pushed past with g4 and kept the h file closed. But now it's impossible. White starting a mating attack. White sacked the piece. Remember that knight on g5 has been sacrificed. This is a mating attack that's just unstoppable. Now we'll have a look at some variations here because this is an interesting moment. If black had taken on h4, which didn't happen in the game, Judith just pushes past with g5, cutting off that bishop e7 and queen d8, cutting them off from the defence. Now if king g8 trying to run, there's a nice variation given by Boris Shipov. Bishop h7 check, again this bishop, this time sacrificing itself. King takes, there's nothing better. Queen f4, threatening queen takes h4 and a mate. So black has to play f5, planning to run the king out to g8 to f7. Queen takes h4, king g8. Now queen h5, preventing the king running. And on the following move, white will play g6. Again, preventing the king running, and there's going to be a mate on h8. So this is an, a decisive attack. Going back a few steps. After this powerful move, 15h4, Burkett had another defence in mind. 
G6. Which is logical. The king wants to come to G7 instead. But white's attack is still absolutely irresistible. Judas takes on G5. King G7. Queen F4. Again, this move. Now Burke has played bishop b7, which is logical. He could have tried rook h8, but Jesus could take that, queen would take, and knight e5 would be a great move. The knight joins the attack, and this bishop on e4 is now backwardly guarding the, the h1 square, so Judas ready for rook h1 with a decisive attack along the h file. If, for example, knight takes knight, queen takes knight check, king back, now simply queen takes pawn on c7, hitting the rook and the bishop, bishop takes pawn on g5 check, and king b1. And white's just winning. The rook on b8 being trapped. So going back to the game, Burke has found nothing better to do than bishop b7 trying to at least swap off this powerful bishop. So a logical plan. But now Judas gets a chance to show off her awesome tactical skills. Rook h7 check, double exclamation mark. She's already sacked a piece and now she's throwing a rook. Just for good measure. You have to take that. And the queen drops back to h2, which is the other point of this nice queen f4 manoeuvre. Now the point is that black now won't get a chance to get his rook over to the h-file. For example, if king g7, Judith would check first on h6. King g8, now the rook on f8 is trapped out of the game. And then rook h1 with a mate, either on h7 or f8, h8. Therefore, Burke just went to g8 straight away a slightly better defence but it doesn't really change anything and rook h1 now mates of h7 and h8 threatened now Burkers probably could have thrown in the towel here but he kicked on for a little while bishop takes pawn check knight takes bishop on g5 Queen takes g5 check. Now, of course, f4, blocking the check and hitting the queen. Now, no, black can't defend the two mates because it's, there's a mate on h8 and on h7. Otherwise, queen f6 would have worked. It would have covered h8, but there's a mate on h7 as well. Spurkus would have had to give up his queen. Queen takes f4 check. Queen takes queen on f4. Bishop takes e4. But now, simply, queen takes bishop. And Burke has threw in the towel here. The queen and rook are still gunning against the black king. And all the end games still are winning for white material up. So that was a fantastic display by Judas. The key moments in the in the game being that sacrifice of the knight on g5, with the amazing follow up of 14 g4, which is quite in a very original way to attack. And the other key moment being that rook h7 sacrifice on move 18, very thematic 
basically sacrificing an entire rook just to stop the black rook on f8 being able to come to h8 and to defend. So brilliant tactics, and um, we'll look forward to her demolishing another super GM next week. Thank you very much.